welcome to One Thought at a Time with Ian Travers, where we get curious about what makes us tick. We're here today with a woman whose eclectic interests are only matched by her range of life experiences. Welcome, Tilda Seddon. Thanks. Thanks for taking time to come on the, the podcast. Of course. Yeah, I mean, in fact, um, we've been talking for about uh, half an hour beforehand, so yeah. we've got some stuff left to talk about. I'm sure we will. Let's uh, just get going then by telling us how you spend your time, Tilda. What do you do? So I'm at university at the moment studying law. So that takes up about 30% of my time, mm -hmm. I would say. I like to um, read and spend time with friends, uh, travel. Um, I like to write. Um, recently, I've been writing and directing a play. So okay. I like doing theatre things and also the reading has been a part of that too. It's okay. like reading more plays, which I've never done before, actually. Okay. I've always like been an avid reader of literature, um, a lot of like fiction, nonfiction, but never plays before. And then starting this degree, we um, like, I'm friends with a lot of people doing mm -hmm. the theater course and they just keep giving me plays. And so I keep reading plays. So, so how have you ended up with, with the play then? Is that, is that part of the, the course that you're doing or is that an, another? No, not remotely. I think there's an, there's an element of theatricality to law, mm. um, like if you go down the barrister track. Okay. But generally, um, no, they don't do too many theatre things in law. So, so that's interesting already, just picking up a theme there. So talk to me about the sort of the parallel between, you know, the, the performance of a, of, of a barrister and the, the parallel. I think that the role or the, like, the through line is convincing someone of something that either you know to be true or if you're an actor, convincing someone that you are someone else. Yeah. And I think that that's sort of um where the through line is there i'm it's almost like curious you know if you've got a really good actor i wonder how, what they're like in the dock mm, yeah and how would you know that they were acting maybe come back to that later yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, reality illusion so let's just do a bit of the journey about how you how you arrived at doing what you're doing now um so to tell us a bit about your your journey that, that got you here so I started in England, was born over here, moved to Australia with my mum mm. when I was about three. So I don't remember moving, mm. but I uh, grew up in Australia, did my schooling over there. Um, when I was 18, I, well, actually when I was 12, I knew that I wanted to move over to the UK as soon as I graduated high school. And um, yeah, so when I was 18, moved over to the UK after applying for the yeah. universities, um, then I actually took a year out. This is something that Luke would have mentioned that I should <laughs> mention. Um, I went to Romania for two months. Okay. Worked on completely spur of the moment. I was looking, I was actually researching online, um, <laughs> like different bear charities that you could donate to because I was bear, like... Bear charity. As in brown the bears. Brown bears, yeah, okay. Because I, okay. I don't know so, I don't know what it was, but I wanted to like, as a long-term life thing, to have a bear charity that I thought was reliable that okay. like would actually give money to bears rather than for like galas. Okay. <laughs> and instead I found a program in Romania for working on like, I think it's the largest bear sanctuary in the Northern Hemisphere. Wow. And they've got about 80 to 100 bears all rehabilitated. Romania has a dark past of mistreating bears. Right. And like, I think a couple of days after my 18th birthday, I, um, yeah, tripped off to Romania for two months. <laughs> for two months. By myself. <laughs> Everyone right. thought I was a bit crazy. I what, think, what did you time. get from that? What, what did you take from that? Um, I learned what it was like to be properly not fully independent, but independent in that I was the one that was deciding what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis okay. in comparison to school where it's kind of, it's mandatory. You're very much kind of ferried from one place to another. Yeah. Whereas that was my first like real taste of, oh, I can like go wherever I want throughout yep. the day. I mean, I had uh, like the volunteering to do during the day, but even that was, um, like the extent of that was we would prepare the 
food for the yeah. bears. And yeah. then I would just kind of wander around the the park for hours and like met a bunch of cool people from like Perfect. all around the world. Yeah. Um, took some snowboarding lessons because the like house was like shared between snowboarding instructors um, and ski instructors and um, the bear people. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's a whole collection of words that I would never thought I'd hear in the same sentence. <laughs> you know, R- Romania brown bears and snowboarding. Yeah, it was I mean, in it's... Brasov, which is just outside Transylvania. So okay. I also like went to Bran Castle, which is the original like Dracula's castle. Right. Very gothic, very sort of, I'll never forget the feeling of living there. It's so specific. Tell me, tell me, tell me about that. It kind of felt like it was in a different time. I'm mean, when I was there, they literally outlawed smoking in restaurants the month like midway through being there, and I saw absolutely no change. People did not stop smoking indoors. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well. But yeah, it was just like even though it was only two months, I think it was at such a sort of. Um, I mean, when you're 18, you remember everything yeah and i think time sort of expands and so the two months for me is so it takes up a lot of space right yeah lots of experiences yeah yeah Yeah. it was wonderful very gothic as i say it felt like i was living in a different time um they're sort of a bit um like they were a bit further behind on technology okay yeah 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 would you go back yeah absolutely i haven't been back since but i definitely would it was cool we used to like trek up this little hill to a, like an old fortress mm. and we would sit up at the fort or there was a castle. So like we would pick um, after a night out whether, whether we wanted to go like walk up the fortress or walk up the castle. Right. And then, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Really so cool. and that was all on the way to then coming back to the UK. Yeah. So why, yeah. why, why come back to the UK? What was what was driving that? Um, I just wanted to, to be honest. It's an interesting thing because... My mum and people always say like, wow, you were 18. That's pretty bold. You must have had to like really muster up courage. And I like to an extent, I do feel that. And I feel like it was a very, um, it was bold, but I never had any doubt. I don't think okay. that I just really wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just kind of following what was, what felt right. Yeah. It there was like an intuition. So there was nothing, there was nothing pushing you towards that decision it was just something that, that felt yeah. right to do mm. so then what did you do tell me about the, the your, your first degree what did you what did you do so my first degree was at edinburgh mm. um university of edinburgh and i studied psychology which about six months before i decided to do that i wanted to study astrophysics um i okay. had like a quick change of heart with that one um okay i can't let that go by. so <laughs> <laughs> astrophysics or, or psychology Sciences. Right, yeah. okay. I was really interested in the sciences. I studied, um, they were called the Suicide Six in school. So right. a bit unfortunately named, but it was biology, chemistry, um, maths, our equivalent of further maths, okay. English. And um, I think that was it. Yeah, the three sciences. So so what was it? How, how come psychology won over? I realized that the books that I was reading were psychology based a lot of the um just yeah reading I was just reading psychology and saying that I was interested in astrophysics which I was yeah and I loved physics class but um in reality I think I was just more pulled towards the sort of um I don't know the the brain in terms of like it being another big unknown space Mm. is an unknown but the brain is even more of an unknown and it's so close i mean we we were talking about this weren't we a little earlier as well and i've it's you we we share a a common interest there i mean although i've not gone down that route i I find it just fascinating and we are continuing to find new stuff out all the time yeah studying the brain is almost a bit similar to studying space because it's observing patterns um and almost this sensation of we're looking at it from a distance, mm. except the jarring thing about the brain is it's simultaneous. It's like the brain studying the brain, you know, it's okay. It's the yeah. weird, the weird thing of doing a psychology degree was I would be in a, um, like a seminar or a class or a lecture about memory and like revising notes at the last minute for an exam on memory and it would say 
Oh, the best the best approach is to have spaced learning, um, like for a long period of time to <laughs> really internalize the information. And it would be just the night before. And yeah. and it worked. Yeah. Well, to an extent. <laughs> <Yeah>. Short term, <laughs> immediately gone. <laughs> Interesting, because give, given the the rate at which the understanding of the importance and the link of mental well-being is very topical now. Do you think that what is being taught and sort of the structure of the the whole um, space of psychology is, is it keeping up? Do you think with modern understanding? I have had different experiences with, and the degree was so varied. Mm. So I think that there are some some practices that are keeping up more, whereas some are really just being left. And um, sort of more prone to like have layers of dust, no one questioning them because, of course, yep. of course, they were right in the 60s when yep. they did these studies. Must be right now. Though. Yeah, exactly. But then um, I think where you had where you had more open mindedness mm. for whatever reason that may be, it was um, I think that that open mindedness translated into like topic or study that felt um, more contemporary and more like true to life rather than just accepted. It is interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, today, you know, we understand, you know, sort of a neurological level, a a lot of, the you know, what's actually happening in the brain. And and sometimes I find it a little scary when you read a book of Victorian times where we were still drilling holes in people's heads. Mm. You know, as it's almost like um, technology. It's moving on so fast and we, you know, we're, we're only a stone's throw away in history from, yeah. you know. Who were doing lobotomies in the 60s, yeah. which is crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, it's the kind of thing where, like, of course, lobotomies, you're addressing a symptom rather than a cause. And if anything, it's like now we know that is an incredibly unethical thing. Yeah. Just because someone on the surface isn't being disruptive mm. doesn't mean that you have like any right to do that in the first place. But I think it's a case of delineating between like delineating solving an issue in mental health or like something that's a problem. Mm. If someone's behavior means that they can't fit into society. Yeah. But then delineating that from uh, like, are we now not just removing people and disenfranchising people because they're inconvenient and they don't fit Mm. like where where's the morality where's the norm yeah exactly it's it's almost like you could have a person who was a genius i mean so many of the past geniuses like um galileo and einstein in their time were just out outcasts Mm. and uh, Galileo and towards the end of his life was um, like bound to his house and just uh, considered crazy because he had these ideas and behaviors that didn't allow him to fit into society. And that was like probably something that they considered like a mental defect yeah, and that they would have tried with a lobotomy if they had thought to, which is crazy because think about, how many steps forward he's brought our understanding of science and astronomy and everything like that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, I mean, what, what is normal? Who knows? Yeah. Um, but our understanding of, um, you know, people's different levels of, of attention um, and the way people's brains, you know, they just work in different ways. And as you say, some very, very clever people mm. probably wouldn't fit what we would consider the... The, the norm um do you think we're getting more accepting of, of that well I'd, i i think we might be just as rigid in terms of social conventions as we as we have been in the past i saw like footage of greta thunberg getting carried off by officials in protest mm. and we're outlawing protests now in the yeah. uk yeah and so many things that we're just like outlawing 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 so that um, and I know these issues are very complex and 
um, we're just like trying to address things in ways that we see fit. But it's mm. just, I still think that we have this drive as a society as a whole to have um, this sort of cohesive social convention abiding population where as soon as you step out and it, it sounds it sounds like um we're living under some sort of social dictatorial regime but to an extent well it's interesting i mean this is this is a whole area which i find quite interesting as well and and, and actually some on a, on a previous episode we got into talking about the role of creative media in the world today and i think this plays into the same space doesn't it the what influences our actions um, what what conditions us mm. uh, to think yeah. the way we do and um yeah there's a there's a story that we are all told and taught as we grow up mm -hmm. um and that and whatever that story is becomes kind of the norm and it's stepping yeah. outside of that exactly. becomes less accepted yeah but. it's like <laughs> not to be dramatic in a soft sense like being born into a society and growing up in it, you're being institutionalized. It's kind of like a, it's a version of a clockwork orange, but mm -hmm. not so intense, hopefully, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but I guess the, the interesting thing and a good thing, and we were chatting a bit about this earlier on as well, is now that we do have a bit of a better understanding about how the head works and how the brain and the mind works, that's now becoming quite accessible to people. Mm. So now where you would have to go and see a specialist to have, I don't know, leeches put on your skin or yeah. something to understand. Now you can say, well, actually, if you change the way you think about that, you might find that gets better. Oh, mm. OK, great. Thanks. And yeah. that's more accessible now, isn't it? Yeah. But you need that freedom or opportunity to readjust. I think people really or like as a society, we need to be better at this has gone wrong. What can we change? And then having the meaningful intervention into unproductive behavior yeah where and just being faster at it but yeah. i think society is getting slower and as humans we can just get into habits negative habits and cycles but they're reinforcing yeah. and um if we could like fig i think a key to meaningful change is meaningful intervention and I think if we have meaningful tools or tools that we find that we can use and default to yeah. and w know when to use them, yeah. then that would be just revolutionary. And when you're talking tools there, you're meaning um, not necessarily, you know, take this pill or do this exercise, no. but almost like a mental exercise, yeah. something at which you, something you can subject yourself to, condition yourself with, mm -hmm. um, do, that's almost like self-help. Yeah, I think that's one of the best things that therapy and like large-scale acceptance of therapeutic practice yeah like that's one of the most meaningful things that we've like gained from that and that is a very busy space now isn't it yeah because there's a lot yeah, of people of uh, and you know there's and there's and there's room for them but there's lots of people now who are saying do it this way mm. this is what you need to do yeah the Whenever, right way to do it the right way to do it. if you want to have a great day today and a great life you need to do yeah. it this way um whereas uh, and they're all, I'm sure, well-meaning, and, and and but I think there's a conversation to be had, isn't there, about mm, definitely, you know, getting to the yeah. One of the of most interesting things that I learned, um, so I was studying in Copenhagen for about a year, also within the Department of Psychology. I'm going to ask you about Denmark. We'll, we'll come yeah. back to that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the University of Copenhagen, um, one of the courses uh, I took was on therapeutic practice, mm. and we essentially like drilled through on a week to week basis mm. um many different forms of therapy like historically that have been used and then like coming to more mod like we went through psychoanalysis and yeah. i don't think that that's used on too much of a large scale anymore uh cbt also mm. um like narrative based one of the most interesting things that our tutor said to us during that was the crucial element in therapy and the one factor that determines someone's outcome whether or not they're going to have a positive outcome or a negative outcome from a series of therapy sessions is their confidence in the therapeutic relationship right. 
and their confidence that it's going to be beneficial and going to improve. So it completely flips on its head our conception and preconception that the meaningful thing is what the therapist has to give or the psychologist has to give to their patient. It's it's almost like, no, it's not a situation where one party tells another party, I've observed you and this is what's wrong. Yeah. Um, and here's what you should do. It's the presumption that that confidence can only be gained from that person realizing in themselves. Right. I have the tools to, um, or like I have access to this therapeutic relationship Yeah. and that engagement, the element of engagement with the process and with the therapist is what is going to allow me to improve. So it's, it's, it's almost you, you, what your success is almost whatever it is, whether it's that therapeutic environment or even, you know, in the, in, in the uncontrolled space of, of, you know, coaching and mentoring as well, it's, mm. it's giving people the confidence to use yeah. the mechanisms that you are offering them so that they internalize it and use it. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. I stuff. know. <laughs> yeah. I was chuffed the day that I found that out. So that was the Denmark, uh, the, the Denmark period. So tell us a bit about, so you ended up in, in Denmark for a, for a period. A yeah. Yeah. I was living over there for a year doing courses. Mm. Um, again, it was quite, it was quite light touch in comparison to my experience with university in the UK. Um, it was very much for each course, you do three courses a semester yeah. and you just write 10 pages on whatever you want. Okay. Even if it's of like minimal relevance to the course, okay. if it's like so tangential, it's barely, um, it barely fits still absolutely valid as long as you've justified yourself and written an essay that's meaningful to you. Um, I had one, yeah. I had one professor that said that she didn't believe in failing students because as long as you tried, then that would have been, and as long as you'd engaged and then that was the meaningful, um, element in <laughs> participating in the course. And I was like, brilliant. I got full marks for that one, actually. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so that was what you did. Tell us a bit about, um, did you enjoy Denmark? Yeah, I loved it. I had a bike would cycle everywhere mm -hmm. truly is a place of four seasons as soon as it was autumn there were leaves everywhere and as soon as it was winter snowy spring flowers blossoming and it's so segmented right. in a way that you don't really get in the uk and definitely not in australia no like here it it could be you know sunny one day and then all of a sudden it's snowing yeah and it's very unpredictable in that sense but there it was very ordered yeah it was very nice and ordered Work-life balance was brilliant. Mm. I worked in a cognitive neuroscience lab for about six months as part of um, the university. Yeah. And it came to like 4.58, everyone was gone. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? Yeah. You know, why yeah, not? You, exactly. know, it's, uh, you know, it's only in the UK isn't it, that you find people, you know, having their lunch yeah. at their desk <laughs> because, you know, heaven forbid you should go for a walk or something, although yeah. that's a bit of a generalisation. And yeah. then you did, a, you did a second degree. So tell us about the, the second degree. What's, what's that? Yeah, so I'm studying at the moment law at the University of York. Um, and that has been interesting and different and similar to psychology in a number of ways. I actually decided I wanted to study law in my third year of studying psychology. Okay. Um, after writing one of the essays for psychology in Copenhagen, actually. Right. Um, I wrote about uh, racial prejudice in the U.S. criminal justice system. Okay. And then looked um, like comparatively at the U.K. criminal justice system, mm. and then um, went to after that on the back of that realizing that I was like had an interest in law went to UCL for a summer school okay um doing Anglo-American business law realized that I loved the structure of law in a similar way to psychology it's just mm. like learning the structure learning more about people through the lens mm. of one of our like large um institutions yep. law being so central yep. I mean psychology is also <clears throat> but um yeah that's an interesting two subjects to study as well isn't it because mm. understanding psychology and uh, bias yeah unconscious bias another word Definitely. that's very topical at the minute but you know that i would imagine having an understanding of that and then being 
uh, in the legal arena, you understand how how that can all play, and even the acting stuff. Mm. You know, if you think about, you've got a good actor, um, and the, you know, sprinkle in some some unconscious bias. Yeah, boy, the barrister's got a, a job on their hands, haven't they? If they don't understand any of that background. Yeah, exactly. I think it's also learning how many things that I learned in my psychology degree I can apply to apply to law and apply to theater and seeing how many similarities they are but if you take a rule from something like psychology and apply it to law it changes and it right. like sort of ah, like has this new nuance I'm trying to think of a specific example because I realize that's quite a vague <laughs> quite a vague thing to say so something like what I was saying about um, the element of confidence being what's most important in a relationship between a therapist and their patient. Yes. The same is true for a client. And um, if you're, and they've emphasized this to us, like mm -hmm. on the law course also, it's how important rapport is. If you okay. have a client, they're going to give you the most useful information if there's that understanding that you have the ability to use it okay. and if there's I don't know just the importance of understanding okay. in like client lawyer relationships and I guess trust plays in there somewhere yeah you know definitely. that's it's you, trust with, without central. that trust then mm -hmm. and that's a common feature everywhere and even in the in the leadership space and the coaching space and the mentoring yeah. space yeah so. in like finance also and um like investment if you have um if you have the element of the public's trust mm. in an institution then it's like they're buying shares but as soon as you lose their trust they're gonna sell shares and the system works so long as you have this flow of um, people having trust and having confidence in the system. Yeah. And that's how we keep the economy going and that's how we keep relationships going yeah, and because, society. Because we, you know, when a, when a bank has a, a, a run on it, it's someone's lost trust in that and mm. suddenly the system then breaks. Yeah. And then we have regulatory crises and we have to overhaul institutions which we comes have. back, again, it circles back it to does. the story we tell ourselves as yeah. we're growing up as, as a society. Yeah. Oh, it's just fascinating yeah. stuff. So, <laughs> so I have a question now then. So because we've now covered, um, we, we've covered um, Romanian and Bears and we've covered mm -hmm. uh, theatre and we've covered psychology and yes. we've, we've covered law. <laughs> oh, I don't know how you're going to, oh, and travel, the importance <laughs> of travel as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What next? Oh, well, I'm moving down to London. Okay. That's a start. I'm going to um, move down with a couple of friends, get a flat, start working in some industry or another, <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, ideally, I'd like to finish my law qualification, yeah. um, probably as a solicitor, just in case I like find some in-house work that I want to do, that kind of thing. I'm... I, I love law. I really do. I, I don't know if I could say that law is my singular mm. career passion. Um, I have like sort of dispersed interest in a number of things. Like I think. Is there a commonality though, do you think with everything that you, that you've done and that you're interested with is, is there somewhere there's something that you think you would like to achieve through whatever it is that you're doing? Hmm. The reason I ask that is, you know, the the interest in in theatre, um, and the the psychology decision rather than the, um, the, the the astrophysics and now the law. It's almost as if there's there's something shaping up which I feel I can do something with with this. Yeah, I think I think the variety of things that I've done is going to give me a unique perspective that I think few people in industry would have. Mm. I was listening to um, a famous designer who sadly died recently, Virgil Abloh. Mm. He was giving a speech. Um, he's given a number of speeches, but he was giving a speech on design at Harvard um, like a year before he died or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And he was talking about, he first studied engineering 
then studied architecture and then went to um, found his own fashion house, which has been like immensely successful. And I love listening to him talk because he has such a clearly unique vocabulary for talking about design that you would not get from someone mm. who had just gone up through fashion school yep. or who had just been like a nepotism baby or something yep. like that yep. where they'd had um a set of experiences that would have led them to there he kind of it was almost like he zigzagged through um through like different avenues yep. and everything that he took from his learning and experiences because he was engaged because he like picked up things as he went he like continued to channel that into his work okay. which ended up being incredibly cohesive because it was like his vision for yeah. it and because he was doing things that he was engaged with and that didn't necessarily reflect what he thought he should be doing it's i i, I think this 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 whole challenging of um you know we work five days a week nine to five and and that's i mean although that's a story that's told a lot for a lot of people now that actually isn't true mm. you know particularly since covid i think that's really mixed things up as well and i think it's really interesting to 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 push the boundaries and and, and mess with that because you know how many how many careers should we have yeah you know? i mean exactly. how many how many different career directions have you even yeah. considered so many <laughs> so, too many <laughs> and I think that's okay, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is okay because um, if you only, well, and it's okay to have one career, but if you only do have, your, you know, you, you have one thing which you do and you do it all the time, that also means that you'll only see the world from one particular viewpoint mm -hmm. as well, doesn't it? Yeah. I think there's also like, it's also to do with the fact that we have such a like solidified idea of what the cookie cutter life stability should look like in terms of nine to five but that doesn't even ex like it doesn't even really exist I mean with these like big firms in London and Hong Kong and New York mm. they it never stops work like you could be having a meeting at two in the morning and that is the social norm but from the outside it's stability and um, this is what you need to do to have stability and to be respectable and to carve out a place for yourself in the world. Um, and like as a law student, you're pushed towards that. Mm. There's like a sort of heavy expectation. That's that, the norm, the expected that that's norm. That's the norm, that you should like get a stable job, like sort of grind for a couple of years, work nine to nine. But then it no longer becomes that. There aren't those boundaries that exist in reality where it's nine to five or nine to nine, it becomes nonstop. It's like nine to two. And then it's like well, nine to like five in the morning well, where you don't leave the office for days. I I still find it quite interesting, the concept of what people call work-life balance. Why don't we just use the word life? Yeah. Because yeah, that's exactly. actually, it's it's all life and how we, how we choose mm. to live it, isn't it? Um, so we could we could chat f for ages, um, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna um, I'm gonna bring us to our last last question, if mm -hmm. if I may. You've had such a rich set of experiences so far, and who knows what what's next. But I wonder if we could conquer time travel. Let's just take that assumption for the minute, and you could write the younger Tilda a note that you would find. What do you think you would write to yourself, knowing what you know today? Honestly, I think when I was younger, I had a like a strong perception that they were right and wrong decisions to be made. And that if I thought hard enough about any given decision, that I could arrive at the correct, the correct pathway or um, like I could somehow like secure stability or control or predictability, etc. If I made the right decisions or like... Um, yeah, I don't know, getting the perfect career by yeah. making all of the um, correct decisions. But I think actually it's it's a case of nothing is actually right or wrong. And in retrospect, when you look back on all of your decisions, we have this like crazy ability to 
have everything make sense when we look retrospectively at mm. it. Like every single decision I've made has led me to here and I wouldn't have wanted it to lead me anywhere else, if that makes sense, because yeah. then I would feel differently about certain things and then it kind of, that's what your sense of self comes from. And I just really feel like having regret as a point of, um, I don't know, attributing regret to life decisions or career decisions, um, unless it's something like immoral and yeah. you've ended up in prison for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think just sort of doing away with that, this is right and this is wrong. So kind like, of making, making a decision with no regrets kind of thing. Because you have made that decision, then it's the right decision. Right. It's flipping the script from... I should make this decision because it's right to because I've made this decision, it's right. It's right. Um, I like that. Yeah. I, I think that if I'd sort of, I don't think too much would have changed because I think I have been quite good at just like going for it anyway and mm. acting out of intuition and a sense of like, I want this, but it would have probably saved me a lot of grief with regards to like oh no if I just like studied a bit harder that week then this would have happened and that would have been more right so um, make the decision and then once you've made that decision that's the right decision yeah. for you yeah, yeah. it's yeah. either or <laughs> brilliant Tilda it's been an absolute pleasure having a discussion with you today thank you ever so much for coming along thanks for having me you have been listening to one thought at a time uh, with our guest today, uh, Tilda Seddon. Uh, if you've enjoyed today's episode, please do like and subscribe, and we're always interested in your comments too. If you'd like to look at our other episodes, you can find those on whoever your podcast provider is or on our YouTube channel. So if you have been, thanks for listening.